are you the sort of person that puts a Unicode snowman into every web form you encounter? You may like the next talk because we have David Ledbeater, who is here, he's come from Australia today, to talk about Houdini of the Terminal. Hi, I'm David. Um, yeah, and I'm here to talk about Houdini, who was a famous escape artist, and a bit of echo there. Okay, that's better. Um, and terminals, and I don't mean electrical terminals. I don't mean airport terminals. I mean video terminals, which we'll get to the finer details of in a moment. But who am I, and why am I interested in this old technology? So I'm an open source engineer at G Research. Um, in the past, I was a site reliability engineer um, at Google. And these days, I work on cloud technologies, so Kubernetes, um, Prometheus, and various other things. Um, I kept accidentally finding security holes, um, so I sort of sometimes do security-related things now. Um, Kubernetes, much more modern technology than terminals, but you access it through a terminal. So at G Research, we use Kubernetes a lot. Um, we have a CNCF sandbox project called Amada, which is a batch scheduler on top of Kubernetes. Um, I'm not really here to talk about that, but um, I'm here to talk about KubeCuttle, which, did you know it has a logo? Um, so KubeCuttle, you say KubeCuttle, so cuttlefish, so the logo's a, got a cuttlefish on it because Kubernetes is a sea of puns all the way down. Um, so why was I looking at KubeCuttle? Well, here's a list of CVEs in Kubernetes. And if you look very closely, the uh, top one there only has a 2.1 score. But if we look a little bit more closely at it, it's got um, an interesting comment there that says, kubectl does not neutralize escape, meta, or control sequences contained in the raw data it outputs to a terminal. So when you're using a terminal, you kind of don't think about how this works, but there's escape sequences in use. We'll get to this a bit more in a moment. But um, what does this mean? It's low severity. And the very interesting thing about this CVE, it wasn't fixed. So the CVE was published, but it wasn't fixed. So here's a different CVE, and this is in BusyBox. And if we uh, skip ahead and compare the two, BusyBox through 1350 allows remote attackers to execute arbitrary code um, if netstat is used to print a DNS PTR record to a VT compatible terminal, um, which is a bit of a mouthful. But basically, is that not the same thing as the top one? Um, so both of these are simply writing data to a terminal um, and not, not escaping it. So they've got vastly different scores. Um, some of that is the actual access complexity, so I'll get to that in a moment. But who was right? And I don't want to have a discussion about CVSS scores, really, but it's an interesting starting off point for comparing these two vulnerabilities. So let's move on. Um, to quickly summarize, we've found two interesting vulnerabilities. One of them's fixed, one of them isn't. What are we going to do? Well, first of all, we need to understand a bit more about terminal escape sequences. Um, but we also need to understand what terminals are. So here's a famous person. Um, and if you look very closely, directly above his head is a white boxy thing. Um, that. And that's a Digital Equipment Corporation, DEC, VT100, which was released in the late 19, actually, 1980s anyway. Um, 1979, potentially. There's varying references. Um, so this was one of the first terminals to implement the ANSI standard for terminal escape codes. Um, and actually, it itself became almost a de facto standard. So you might have seen VT100 in various references. And we'll get to that a bit more in a moment as well. So we can find this series of terminals in common use throughout the 1980s. Um, Grace Hopper here. And if you look very closely on, does this laser pointer work? Yes, it does. Lovely coffee cup there. Uh, luckily, we've moved on from those coffee cups, polystyrene ones. but we're still using things from VT220s these days. Um, the interesting thing is that she's not got a general purpose computer on her desk. She's got a terminal here. And if you look closely, that, um, 
that, that's actually a printer. It's not a, it's not a computer. Um, and it plugs into the terminal. So you, the terminal is talking over a serial cable, which you know these days you might talk over a TCP connection. It's not vastly different, really. It's something you can stream a single stream of data down. Um, and yeah. So here's the product, here's the product brochure again. Um, and if you look very closely, you probably can't see it. It says VT100, the industry standard. And then the one that uh, Grace Hopper had on her desk was this one, VT220. It says monochrome text. And then there's some interesting ones in front of that, which can do color and graphics, which again raises a question, how can they do color and graphics when they have a, essentially a text serial connection? So this ANSI standard that I've already mentioned, um, I'm going to say X364, 1979. And that uh, is a bit of a mouthful, obviously. But the interesting thing there is the 1979. So this standard was released in 1979. Um, and it defines things like color and various other things. Um, but it's almost a bit like HTML. So um, oh, these slides are in a different order. OK, so where, the, where this gets interesting is recent Microsoft documentation, Windows 10 actually added support for VT100s. So Microsoft Windows Terminal and even um, Conhost actually support VT100 sequences now. So we've almost come full circle. And Windows supports essentially a standard from 1979 with various additions. Some of these are kind of de facto standards um, and so on. So the interesting thing here is Windows did historically have support for this. So um, ANSI.sys supported some of the ANSI standard. But the recent support that Microsoft has added is actually a more complete implementation of VT100s. So this talk is going to focus on VT100 terminals and derived things, which it turns out most terminals we use are VT100 derived. So I kind of skipped this in the wrong order already. So an HTML sequence we take for granted. We've got an angle bracket at the start. I don't mean to insult you by showing you this. I just want to compare it to escape codes in a moment. So we all know if we can get that magic angle bracket at the start into some output, then it's probably game over. We've got a cross-site scripting vulnerability, or something bad can happen. You know, I can put a script tag there and Whatever, whatever I want to do. So we then get this interesting character. So this is actually ASCII character number 27. So it's a non-printable character, which is why I've given it a weird background there and why it sort of looks a bit different. But it is actually a character. So um, if we just compare these in a slightly different way, in a, in a C style string, we can write the angle bracket with x free c because its hex code is free c. Um, an escape is 1b, so we can write 1b like that. And into a string, we've got an escape sequence. Now, both of those actually would set the text to be red. So the font color red, obviously, we probably these days use CSS or something, but it would still work. Um, 31 is, it turns out, red. Um, and so this can all be sent along a serial link. Technically, you could send HTML along a serial link. Very similar, really. Um, it's obviously a bit of an older technology, so it's a bit compressed and not as readable. But it's, it's not that different. Um, so from now on, when I show some text, I'm actually going to use these styles. So um, Control-C, when you press Control and C on your keyboard, you generate Control-C. Um, but then caret left bracket is the common way in Unix of expressing an escape key. So um, Windows usually does it a different way. Um, because this is sort of coming from a Unix background, I'm going to use Unix-style things. Um, so many Unix tools will do that, and you probably don't even realize that you see things like that on your screen, and you just know what that means. Um, so one cool Unix terminal program is Cmatrix. So it makes you look like a real hacker. Um, so you know, I can run that cool matrix. So where this gets interesting is I can pipe its output to cat minus v, and that's the same thing. I've just escaped all the escape codes. And if you look closely, you'll see there's a 32 in there. Um, and oh, did I have the screen there? Um, so 
If we then look closely again, this is the Appendix H of the ANSI standard I mentioned. And 32 is green display. So take a, take a standard from 1979. It's actually a bit confusing because this was not standardized entirely at that point. You can see there's reserved for future standardization, which if you looked very closely in that previous output, you would have seen 39. So they've, things have changed slightly since 1979, but we can actually use a standard from 1979 to change text on a modern terminal to be green, which is kind of cool. Um, there's a bit more to this. Um, this is Windows Terminal. Um, if you look very closely up there, I don't know how visible that is, there's a 41M there. And if we just look back here, 41M is a red background. So yeah, we can, um, we can use the standard to change, change the color of the background and the text. Um, sorry, my notes are flickering, but I... Okay, um, so anyway, this, this all works on a modern system. Um, and the takeaway is if we can write unfiltered text to a terminal, then we can do all these things like changing color. Um, and the BusyBox CVE that we saw, the, one of the comments in that was, alternatively, an attacker can change the color of the terminal, which, yes, they can. It's true that if you can get unfiltered text into a terminal, you can do that. Same with HTML, you know, you can choose to change the color of a web page if you can exploit an XSS vulnerability. You can probably do worse things, but um, yeah. So, We've kind of done 1979, we've done the 1980s. Let's go on to 2003. So 20 years ago, um, there's some interesting things. This is from Wikipedia, new English words that were coined, botnet, and also China dealt with the first SARS outbreak. So um, something else more interesting happened in 2003, which is this paper from HD Moore. So, there's various things in this, but we've already talked about escape sequences. So let, let's move on to window title reporting. Um, so like I showed you how you can change the color, this is a similar thing, um, except this blue carrot is pointing at a right bracket rather than a left bracket. Um, zero means set the title. Um, then this string here up to the terminator is the title. So OK, that's quite simple. If you've customized your shell prompt or something, you might have come across how to do that uh, to change the title of the window to your desire. Um, it's pretty simple, but it's an escape sequence that can actually take a string. So, you know, I've mentioned string handling now, so, well, that, that probably gives you an idea of what can happen. So, this isn't an exploit. I've changed the title to calc exe. Um, but there's then an escape sequence to ask for the title. So this means the terminal writes something back to you. So you query the terminal and it responds. So you can query the terminal what size it is, and it will respond with a special escape sequence that says this is my size. Um, you, you can also use this one, which I ask for the title, except what it's going to give me back is the title that I just set. So this actually isn't an exploit as such. I would write calc exe to the terminal, um, but it would be pretty obvious to the user that calc exe has been written. They'd still have to hit enter and so on. So it turns out that um, in certain cases, you could actually put a new line and another new line in the title. And so then it's enter, calc exe, enter. And when you, when you uh, run this escape sequence, it kindly presses enter for you. So let's demo a 20-year-old exploit. Um, so as I've said, this is just using printf. Um, Commander is a package that has various Unix utilities in for Windows. Um, so run that in a moment. Oh dear. Uh, OK, calculator did pop up there. Don't know why the screen flickered there. Not ideal. But anyway, so as you can see, if you, if you look closely, the, um, the exploit ran, calculator popped up. Um, let me just see if I can get that. Um, there's just a bit of a delay here, but so this escape sequence that, yeah, okay, slash r is, is actually the control m that you saw, which is a carriage return. Um, there we go, hit enter, and calculator pops up. So this was Connie MU using Commander. 
So obviously I patched this back in, right? Uh, no. This actually is CVE 2022-46387. So this was a CVE I found last year that basically this particular console program for Windows uh, hadn't actually patched a 20-year-old exploit and just implemented it um, as, as, well, as a feature, basically. So that's kind of interesting, but um, let's move on to 2019. So 2019 was described as the best year in human history um, up to that point. And obviously that's foreshadowing slightly. I won't go into too much. Um, but anyway, in 2019, Windows Terminal was released. So So anyway, so like I was using with Con EMU, I was using printf, right? So asking a user to run printf to attack themselves is like asking someone in a web browser to like use the JavaScript console to attack themselves. Not really very, um, yeah, not really an exploit, is it? So what we're looking for is things that are classed as CWE 150, which is improper neutralization of escape, meta, or control sequences. So that kubectl or CVE that I mentioned, it doesn't actually define a CWE ID here, but it is basically CWE 150. I mean, you can discuss exactly which class it fits into, but conveniently for us, it's not there, and I'm going to say it's this one. So um, this, this is where things get a little bit interesting. So I'm going to demonstrate using Windows Terminal um, how we can deliver something using Kubernetes. So I'm, I'm going to run the exploit first, and then I'll, then I'll talk through it. Um, this, sorry, minor tech difficulties with the video here. Um, so th this is going to use uh, Kubernetes, um, and it's something as we would have it set up at my company. So we have a shared um, Kubernetes cluster with multiple tenants inside it. Um, we use namespaces for isolation, but if an attacker, for example, got access to one namespace, we believe that it's quite locked down. Um, but maybe we can convince the administrator to try and debug the um, a namespace that has been attacked via running kubectl or something. So to, to demonstrate this, I'll um, have two tabs up here. And on one, I'm going to be the attacker. And for the sake of a demo, I'm going to run something using the kubectl run subcommand. Maybe actually the attacker would already have a container running or something. Point is, this is running as nobody. They've got not really any permissions. It's removed um, API access. So there's a thing in Kubernetes called termination log. Um, and if we write to it something, um, when, when that pod dies, the administrator will see the error message that's written there. Um, so we've written something there. And now the victim is actually the administrator in this case. And they go, maybe they get an alert saying, oh, look, this pod just re, ah. No, no, no. Sorry. Oh, I broke that, didn't I? There we go. OK, sorry. Uh, we don't have a way to fast forward these videos. So um, I'm just going to have to talk for a moment about what, what's happening here. Um, so yeah, so there's something running in Kubernetes. The, the attacker has somehow got this pod ready. No API access. Um, I'm not going to try and use the laser pointer this time, so I don't accidentally press the wrong button. Um, so anyway, you know, you probably if you look on the screen, you realize what's going to happen in a moment anyway. But um, we now change over to the victim tab. So the victim, as I said, is the administrator. and they run get pods. They see that it's recently restarted, as you can see up there. Um, and so a common thing to run is run kubectl describe. So you'd say, describe to me what's happening with this particular pod. Um, and so they scroll up a bit, and it says it's terminated, it's completed. And there's a blank message, which is a bit strange, but OK. So they decide that they're going to open a new tab to see what's happening. Um, OK, uh, that was unexpected. So. What actually happened here? Um, well, this was Windows Terminal CVE um, 2022. Um, this is the first time an exploit for this has been um, revealed. And as you can see, it's actually quite simple. So the way this actually works is there's a feature in Windows Terminal that actually comes from Con EMU, interestingly. So this 
this particular 9-9 is a sort of defined escape sequence. And none of this is standard. It's kind of just agreement with all the different terminal emulator authors that the, this particular range is res reserved something. So as you saw, zero was title. Um, nine is kind of what Con Connie MU has reserved for itself. And nine is a sort of sub sub range that they've they've reserved. Anyway, so this this sets what your current working directory is. So the, the idea of this feature is you embed this in your shell prompt or something, and it will basically say, this is what my working directory is. Um, and then when you duplicate a tab or something like I just showed, the idea is it can then, the, the, the terminal itself can change into that directory for you. Um, and yeah, the, the tab will then be the right, the right uh, place. So I'll just let you stare at that for a moment while I take a drink. Um, what kind of vulnerability do you think this is? So the clue here is the, the orange, orange brackets. They, they, um, they point at two quotes. So what was actually happening is underneath this, um, Windows Terminal is running something like this. So if you look closely at the string that the escape sequence puts in, um, it ends, the, it ends the, the quoted string, puts calc exe there, and that results in running WSL with cd to slash, it doesn't really matter what that is, um, calc exe, and as WSL is integrated with Windows, it's opening WSL, but then it's calling straight back into Windows, running calc, and calc doesn't really care what its arguments are, so um, we just need those there to make the um, string balance itself. But essentially, yeah, we, we run calculator, um, and the, the, actual, the actual exploit, if you look closely, actually ran calc as a subcommand and then ran the shell as well. So we can basically run pretty much any Unix command we want at that point. Um, and we could, if it was something other than calc, it would potentially run in the background and the user wouldn't even know it happened. Um, the, only, the only sort of saving grace is that this is only in the duplicate tab functionality, so it wasn't like a totally hands-off remote code execution. So that's actually kind of an interesting point here. I'd finished at this point, right? I'd, I'd found this kubectl CVE that was unfixed. I was like, what can be done here? Can we, can we actually make this into something? And yeah, I'd got code execution. Um, so you know, the scenario is we've got a Windows client machine here the administrator's using. We've got an attacker who somehow has got into the Kubernetes cluster, but they're in a very restricted namespace. They found a very unique way to break out of it. So yeah, I was finished at this point, right? Well, um, this is interesting. In, in 2003, H.D. Moore's paper has a scenario, which I really suggest you go and read, because it's, it's amazing as a historical artifact. Um, it says, the administrator of a small web hosting company is very proud of their new Pentium 4, um, 2.5 gigahertz, I think it is. Um, so they, yeah, they've got this new Pentium 4. They're really proud of it. They're, they're running a transparent terminal, because that's like the latest trend. And they're tailing the web logs from their personal website to see who's visiting them. Um, and some attacker has worked this out, and they're looking at the web logs, and they've got a terminal exploit, and they, they own the administrator through them running tail on their terminal. So these days, we don't really run tail on web logs. We probably don't even run Apache anymore. But it's very common for developers to run tools on their workstation, like Python free HTTP server, which you change into a directory, run that, and it will serve the contents of that directory. So that's cool. Um, I, I think you can see what's going to happen here. So we're, we're on item two now. Um, and I'm just going to talk through this one quickly. So here we're running curl. Um, OK, we've, we've got it running locally. That's fine. Um, what happens if we try and put an escape sequence? OK, that doesn't work, because curl, curl on the client side is checking our URL. But what if we construct something ourselves? So here we're putting just a single escape to check whether this will work. Um, we're going to print that, and then we're going to pipe it to netcat. So obviously, we're just attacking ourselves on localhost here, but oh dear. Uh, sorry about the screen blanking. Um, so anyway, so let's see what we can do. Yeah, we can change color. So here, we've changed the color of the web log in the victim. Um, we've just added cat minus v on the attacker here, so the attacker doesn't attack themselves. Um, so 
I mentioned before changing the title. So what if we change the title, but we don't finish the escape sequence? Well, it turns out we can now stop the web log from actually printing anything. Sorry, this is flashing. Um, so the, yeah, the, the web log here is um, stopped. We, we then put the ending control sequence in, and you see it con completes the line, but we, we hid some requests there. So even without a terminal vulnerability, we can use this vulnerability in Python here to essentially hide a request. Um, so now we've used this particular um, escape sequence that asks it for what the color is. Um, and so this, this particular sequence is asking what the color is. Um, and as it, you see, 31M up there. So the terminal replied with that. So we've got a reply from the terminal, so we can control its content. So it turns out there's a bug here where if we put something other than what should be there in, it replies with the invalid thing saying, sorry, I don't support that particular thing you just asked for, but here it is. So if you look very closely at the top, I've now got semicolon ls semicolon there. But that's not actually really doing anything, because we're still running inside Python. We've got Python running in the top thing. So we've written some text to the terminal as if the user typed it, but it's not going to run that yet. I say yet. So if you look at the bottom, there's now an x3 there. And so x3 is hex code number three, which is also known as control C. And there we go, keyboard interrupt received exiting. So developing this live, essentially, we've now got a way to quit Python from a remote, from a remote um, client of the web server. So that's kind of bad. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, for the Connie MU exploit, slash R is carriage return. So in this case, we've actually run ls. Um, because I'm running this in a directory that doesn't have anything in it, ls doesn't show anything, so I'll just manually run touch foo there. Uh, sorry. Anyway, uh, we run that again while the screen blanked, and foo has now appeared. So we've basically got all we need to do here. So just complete the exploit. We'll change that ls to open our favorite program, um, rerun Python up here, and there we go. So this was a CVE in item two that was fixed around November last year. Um, if this is working, yes. So it's also worth noting that the, the Python issue, they didn't consider it a CVE because if you don't have a terminal exploit, this isn't actually exploitable in itself, but they did fix it. So there's a security release of Python that fixes the Python side of this where it escapes what it outputs. Um, and there's a fix for item two that was released under that CVE that actually fixes this issue. Um, but how does this actually work? So there's a special DEC, uh, Digital Equipment Corporation, escape sequence called DEC RQSS, which means roughly request screen state or something. Um, so in this particular example, M is the mnemonic for color. As you saw very much earlier on, we did 31M to change the color to red. So M in terminal escape codes means color. Uh, it's a bit more complicated than HTML, but really it's not that, that much more um, advanced. It's just much shorter, because obviously in the old days, this was going over a serial line that was slow. So if we send that, we get a reply that says, I'm currently red, so it says 31M, I'm Red. Um, so if it doesn't support something, it actually replies with something that says, zero, I don't support that, but here's ls anyway. So we can now run ls. Um, so I'm, I'm calling this particular one a full echo back attack, because it means that we can run things like an enter. We can send enter. We can send control C. Um, there's also cases of a limited echo back attack. So the original HD Moore paper I mentioned uh, covered some X term issues. Um, but because of how the control sequences were implemented, you couldn't get a control C in there. You couldn't get a new line. So you had to trick the user into pressing enter. But there are tricks you could do there, like you can change the color of the screen to be um, dark so they can't actually see the text that you've written to the screen. And then you can output something like press enter. Uh, so there, it's kind of almost a social engineering within the user's terminal attack. But clearly, if, if, if you've got this far, then you know, 
most terminal users aren't that naive, but maybe there are ways that this could be used to attack people. So some of these maybe aren't these days something we'd consider critical because it's not like a hands-off remote code execution, but there are many possibilities um, for this. So um, just to sort of mention the other classes of attack, the Windows terminal one I found, um, obviously it failed to escape something that it was passing to, to a command further on, and so a classic lack of escaping. Um, there's also some bugs. Uh, I didn't find this one, but someone found uh, in Xterm, Sixel is actually an image format. So um, the old deck terminals that I mentioned a, a while ago that could support graphics, one of the things they could support was bitmapped graphics. Um, not many terminal emulators actually support that, but um, Xterm does. So there was a buffer overflow in that because essentially it's an image format, and of course it has a buffer overflow. So, um, but I want to talk about something else. Um, and if this hasn't broken your threat model yet, then um, I want to talk about SSH. So a common setup is something like this, where you've got the client, a jump box, and a production host. Um, and so it's well known um, with that attack from MITRE that if the jump box is compromised and you're using something like an SSH agent, then someone with access to the jump box can potentially hijack another user's authentication um, via the SSH agent socket um, and SSH onto further machines using that. Um, and I think most um, operations staff are aware of this and have ways of defending against that. You know, you make sure your jump box is really secure, or you use SSH minus capital J to access a jump host that instead does TCP port forwarding. And so you've got SSH going over encrypted SSH rather than um, decrypting the SSH connection before it talks to the secondary host. Um, but obviously, this depends on your network. Um, but where this, where this gets interesting is what about the production host itself? So if we've got a terminal exploit, can we, can we do something there? So these terminal exploits allow us to write back text as if the user typed it. So they're not actually behaving like a normal user would. They're, the terminal itself is writing something back. Um, so where this gets interesting is what if we essentially run a command like exit and then run another command? So if a user's typed SSH some host and they've left that SSH connection open, for example, um, can we actually get back to the previous host they SSH from? Well, I mean, I'm foreshadowing now, aren't I? So um, it's not quite as simple as what I showed with the exit because there's a bit of buffering that goes on. Um, but so this is item two again. Um, we've got a victim at the top. Um, for the sake of development uh, purposes, this is actually the, like, the same uh, host and whatever, but it could actually be a different user provided you've got root access on this machine. So you see here the, the attacker on the bottom wrote something to the terminal that meant some text appeared here. So um, if we've got the process ID of the shell, we essentially can force that user to disconnect, um, and then we've got a little bit of buffer to play with, and we can actually run a command. So um, if you look very closely here, so essentially what we did is we, we stopped the shell up here so it didn't read any input, which means that the buffer of the shell is no longer reading anything, which means that the packet that the terminal is going to send back over SSH is not really accepted. Um, and so it sits somewhere in the ether, as it were. Um, and then when we kill minus nine the shell, um, it then forces the connection to close there. Um, the terminal echoes this back. Um, so it, it's a little bit of a race here. Um, it mostly works like maybe one time out of 20 it doesn't work. Um, there are tricks you can do there, though, that if it doesn't work, um, you can write more output, for example. So you've, nothing stops you writing like more than a TCP um, buffer size or really anything. So um, it's almost like this is just a simple variant of this attack. You could, you could do various other things. If so, all you need in this case is a vulnerable terminal emulator, a user who is SSH to a host, and if an attacker has got access to that host, either as that user or as root, then they can potentially run a command on not the host that the user is SSH to, but on the host that the user is coming from. So in some cases, people don't take these terminal emulator vulnerabilities that seriously because it's like, well, you can't use this for like, um, you know, various things. But, but here we can obviously um, traverse a network and 
we do need a we do need a terminal exploit and we do need certain other conditions but um, there are ways that this can be used um, in particular uh, scenarios that could be things that at least maybe break your threat model um, certainly broke mine when I considered that leaving an SSH connection open overnight um, might have been bad um, this this bug that I'm using was actually present in item 2 for about two years before it was fixed um, I'm not aware of anyone having exploited this, um, but it was there, um, you know, the kind of thing that a threat actor could, could do something evil with. Um, so that bug in item two was actually a variant of an X-term CVE from 2008. So we had a variant of a 2003 bug, a variant of a 2008 bug. Um, so maybe no one else was looking at these, or maybe I just got lucky, but I don't know. Um, I found that particular bug in two different terminals, which, was a bit telling. So it turned out that actually there was a mistake in the X-term control sequence documentation, which the other terminal emulator authors had faithfully reproduced, and they'd reproduced the bug that had been patched in X-term, but the documentation had been updated to say that the, the bug had been fixed. So that's, that's why this particular bug reoccurred. Um, so in total, I found six potential remote code execution CVEs. There's various different severities on these. Um, I demoed the item two, Windows Terminal one, and Con EMU. The, the other one, uh, Swift Term, is uh, written in Swift, and it's embedded in some iPhone terminal apps. Um, so that's probably the, the least uh, to worry about, because not many people are actually SSHing to anything from their phone, or at least not important production hosts. But um, that's that. Um, the RSVT Unicode one, I don't have time to talk about, but um, I posted it to OSS Security. And if you're interested, it involves um, running Perl code, which uh, is quite interesting. And it's a quite an interesting little failure to escape in a non-obvious way vulnerability. Um, so how can we defend against these attacks? Well, clearly patching. Um, these are all fixed now. Um, escaping. So when you're printing something to a terminal, you kind of do actually have to think about where did that, where did that input come from? Um, not just because the terminal could be vulnerable to something, but as I've shown, you can change the color. Um, there's also escape sequences to move around the terminal. So not even on the line that you're printing, but someone could actually go and change three lines above what you were printing and trick the user into thinking that the, the output was something else. So because Windows now supports these terminal sequences, um, the, the reference that I showed earlier, th there's actually a way of turning it off. So it depends what your application is choosing to do. But many applications by default now are having these escape sequences processed in their output. So it's something that for a long time was only a concern in the Unix world. But now uh, Windows Terminal has to care about this. Um, I found several other bugs in Windows Terminal that I haven't gone into here that could result in denial of service attacks and a few other things. Um, yeah, defense in depth. So I've got an idea for this. And one of the interesting ones is if you looked back at when we were exploiting those escape sequences, it always wraps it in an, in an escape sequence. So it's not like it writes the raw text. It writes something that has um, escape and then some letters and things. So it's actually possible to process for those escape sequences. Um, and that's, that's something that I'm not yet, haven't been able to get a patch in, but I'm hopeful that I can potentially get a patch into Bash um, I've got a prototype for ZSH into how this can be prevented as a defense in depth measure. Um, if there's any PowerShell people around, I'd be interested in talking to you as well. I don't know if it would be as easy to do that, but there's potential that um, you know the PS read line or something could actually take this into account. Um, and the other one is just user awareness. So um, I kind of want to sort of talk about this. I think we've all trained, hopefully, trained our users and us as well that this is a bad idea. Like, you know, this is a thing that was popularized by Docker and various other tools um, sort of 10 years ago as a really quick way to install myself is to curl the thing. Um, and as, as various people pointed out, um, there's, there's, ways of, there's ways of tricking this. So here I'm running just a simple curl um, for, and I get a script that says echo good. Um, but what, what if I actually pipe that to sh dash, what do I get? Oh dear. Um, so this isn't really an attack as such. This is, this is well known that if I can 
get terminal escape sequences into something, um, I, can, I can do things. So in this case, the, the blank line that you don't see up there actually contains that. Um, and then this, this is a terminal escape sequence that just clears that line, but it's in a comment. So um, if you just cat that to the screen, um, that's there, but no one can see it. Um, and obviously, that's, that's quite a simple variant of this. Um, there was a recent publication by Cambridge University about Trojan source, which uses Unicode um, overrides to hide things in source code. Um, and even some editors like VS Code had to patch for that, because that wasn't just terminal escape sequences. That was actual um, text output and text display in a terminal and in an editor as well. Um, so that, that's, that's all I had to say. Um, if you trust me, there's a QR code there. Unfortunately, minor technical issues mean that that's not live yet. So you might have to deal with the fact you get a 404. And hopefully, I'll publish that later. Um, I'll be probably in the villages session. Um, sort of, you can find me around there anyway if I haven't and ask me. Um, there's hopefully going to be a paper there. I'm still waiting on some confirmation of um, some patching from people before I publish that. Um, I'll go into details of that when I actually publish it. Uh, should be a day or so away. Um, so in summary, these were bad vulnerabilities. Um, but they're not really that serious, right? This, they were bad. But severity-wise, you have to have a user who is quite aware to be attacked. Um, it's also quite easy to patch these. I mean, it's not. It's interesting because terminals maybe aren't treated as web browsers are, but actually they are just like web browsers. They are dealing with displaying untrusted content. And maybe we don't think about that. So yeah, the, the, the saving grace is that you know, I sent this audit of terminal emulators, and I found a bunch of vulnerabilities. The interesting thing is some of these are three year old, sorry, 20 year old vulnerabilities that have existed for recreated three years ago. Um, so it is possible to audit for these. And in particular, like where you reply in a terminal emulator, I could basically a bunch of these I just did by grep. So I'm fairly confident that um, Windows Terminal is open source now. I'm fairly confident that I have found most of the vulnerabilities there. I can't say all of them. Um, but I'm, it's nowhere near a complex uh, attack area as a web browser. So that's a bit of a sa saving grace. Um, but also, these are, these are old-fashioned exploits. I think, I think that's something that we have to remember. You know, This is the 20th black hat, as it's been said. That was a 20-year-old exploit. Um, it's concerning that I can literally find an exploit from 20 years ago, literally reuse it, and it works. Um, and it wasn't just one term emulator. Multiple had copied essentially the same thing and not really thought about what they were implementing in terms of the feature that. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have a good answer to that one. But I think we need to do better. Um, full echo back is a powerful primitive. Um, this, as I showed with the SSH attack, it's possible to do quite scary things. Um, I don't really have any sort of amazing thing to say about that, except there are things that we can do to do defense in depth. So you know, developers um, need to think about actually security engineering. We need to think, oh, we're printing something into a terminal. Maybe I should escape escape characters. Um, they're literally called escape characters. Interesting. Um, so yeah, um, that's pretty much all I had. So thank you very much for your time. Um, sorry about the minor technical difficulties. Hopefully, the videos were still understandable. If you want to see them again, see me in the villagers session. Um, and that's me. Thank you.